just the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of love and hate with Cicely Tyson as your hostess. Here's a preview. Now, let's face it. When your father passed away, I have to hang on to this job. But Darlene knows what I think of her. And I let her know that Mrs. Perry wouldn't like her clothes and jewelry being tried on. Well, don't let her get you down, Mom. You'll just have to bear with it for a few days. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Cicely Tyson. Mr. and Mrs. Perry are about to go on a short vacation. In their absence, they are entrusting their house to their son, Herb, and daughter-in-law, Darlene. While Mr. Perry sits out in the car, anxious to get to the airport, Mrs. Perry remains inside for a moment longer, trying to remember what she might have forgotten to pack, and giving last-minute instructions to Harriet, her housekeeper, and to Darlene. I'm on my way, Harriet. You have the instructions for spring cleaning I gave you. Oh, yes. They're in my pocket, Mrs. Perry. And you work at whatever pace suits you. I don't want you to feel burdened. If you feel tired near the end of the day, go home a little early. But uh, I want the work done by the time we get back. But Darlene will be here most of the time to answer the phone and make sure the house is secure so you won't be disturbed. I'm sure you and Darlene will get along fine. Bye, Harriet. You have a nice vacation, Mrs. Perry. Thank you, Harriet. And Darlene... I'm sure you and Herb will keep the house secure while Mr. Perry and I are away. Oh, yes, of course, Mother. The greater responsibility will be yours because you'll be home most of the time. Oh, I feel so relieved knowing that you and Herb will be here at night. As long as burglars see someone's at home, they won't try breaking in. Don't worry. I'll protect your things. Enjoy yourself in the Virgin Islands. Oh, we will. Golfing, swimming, and daiquiris every day. You can't beat that. Oh, Mr. Perry's getting impatient. Now, remember what I told you before. Harriet, you have your instructions for spring cleaning. Darlene, you won't have to concern yourself with Harriet at all. I want you and Herb to keep the house secure. All doors locked. Hello, Sue. My in-laws just went on vacation, and Herb and I have the house all to ourselves for a while. That's right. Fully equipped with a maid included. And guess what? We want you and Ron to come over for dinner the night after tomorrow. That's right. We'll dine in elegance with the best china and crystal money can buy. Oh, don't be silly. It's no problem for me. Harriet's here. She doesn't have much to do. She can help me. Isn't that something? Too bad we don't have a butler. All right. See you then. And that's only the beginning of our story. Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Spring Cleaning, by Chris Fortunato. Our stars, Virginia Gregg and Joan McCall. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. and Mrs. Perry drove away, Darlene made her plan. Meanwhile, Harriet went about her chore, not suspecting that Darlene's plan required her assistance. Or should I say, complicity. Let's see how it's leaving towels here in the hallway for the time being while I put these sheets away in the master bedroom. Oh, well, well, excuse me, Darlene. I didn't expect to find you in Mrs. Perry's bedroom. No, oh, that's all right, Harriet. I'm just trying on a few things. Well, I'll put these sheets in the linen closet and be out of your way in a minute. What do you think of this dress, Harriet? Does it hang properly? Oh, well, it looks fine to me. Well, look at the back. Does it fit properly? It's not too baggy, is it? No. No, it looks fine, but it just feels as though it was bunching up under my arm. No, it's all right. But, darling, yes. Isn't that Mrs. Perry's dress? Yes. Why? I don't know. She'd like her dresses being worn while she's away. Mrs. Perry should be happy to see me wearing her dress. She and I have a very warm relationship. We're not merely mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. We're very good friends. We have a deep affection for one another, and she trusts me. Oh, I see. Well, now then, I think I'll try on this coral necklace. 
Could you fasten it for me? There. Oh, it goes beautifully with this dress. The rich orange against the background of black and green. You know, darling, Mrs. Perry doesn't even wear that coral necklace herself. It's a sentimental item, she told me once, and I know how protective she is with some of her things. It's far too protective, if you ask me. But don't you worry about it, Harriet. You'd be better off not concerning yourself with my relationship with my mother-in-law. We'll get along nicely, Harriet, if you'll just help me with a few things while Mrs. Perry's away. What do you mean? Herb and I are having some friends over for dinner day after tomorrow. When the time comes, I'll need the table set for four with the best china and silver in the house. Today, I need you to do the shopping for me. I have quite a list made up. Oh, why, Mrs. Perry never asked me to do the shopping. And besides, I have the spring cleaning to do. Oh, I'm sure your spring cleaning won't take up every minute. Oh, yes, it will, Darlene. Today, I'm supposed to vacuum and dust the living room and polish all the mahogany furniture in the bedroom. Oh, and it's the furniture. You mean it needs polishing? We can see our reflections in the high boy over there as it is. It's as though we were looking into a mirror. Yeah, Mrs. Perry wants it polished, and she can tell if it's been freshly polished or not. Well, there'll be plenty of time for you to do that. And here's the list, Harriet. Oh, I don't know about this, darling. I'd do the shopping myself if I had the time, but I have to work at the gallery this afternoon. Oh, there'll be no strain on you. The market delivers. Oh, yeah. Uh, come on now, Harriet. A nice, leisurely walk to the market never hurt anyone. <sighs> All right, but... I don't like the idea of neglecting my work for Mrs. Perry. Now, she told me exactly what it was I was supposed to do. Mrs. Perry will never know. Mm. Oh, boy, is that ever good. Oh, what a day. It's good to be home. At least I'm the boss in my own apartment. Tired, Mom? If you want, I'll fix dinner tonight. No, no, Jane. I'm not really tired. I just had a terrible day, that's all. Did Mrs. Perry leave today? Yeah, that's right. And she left her son and daughter-in-law in charge of the house. Well, that daughter-in-law, Darlene, is some cookie, I'll tell you. What happened? Does she get along with her? Mm, she's too bossy. That's the problem. No sooner had Mrs. Perry gone out the door than Darlene was in the master bedroom trying on Mrs. Perry's clothes and jewelry. <sighs> Then she had the nerve to tell me to do her shopping when she knew how much work I had to do for Mrs. Perry. I had direct orders to get the spring cleaning done. What did you do? What could I do? Darlene's part of the family. She gives me an order, so I don't think I have much choice. Now, let's face it. When your father passed away, I have to hang on to this job. But Darlene knows what I think of her. And I let her know that Mrs. Perry wouldn't like her clothes and jewelry being tried on, and she wouldn't like Darlene sending me off to do something I'm not supposed to do. Well, don't let it get you down, Mom. You'll just have to bear with it for a few days. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard. She gets more hoity-toity by the minute. (laughs) When she grew up down on Baxter Street, her family was too poor to buy her shoelaces. Now that she's hitched up with Herb Perry, she thinks she's the queen of England. Uh, Mom, don't you think one drink's enough? Nope, not after putting up with Darlene. Yeah, I guess I worry too much. I think going up the college day. Fine. Can you believe it? Just two more months and I get my degree. Then I can look for a good job and I won't have to work in that coffee shop any longer. I can't wait. How's that fella you've been getting serious with? I'd like to meet him one of these days. Well, I'd like you to meet him, but he's always so busy. Uh, maybe this summer he'll have more free time. I don't even know his name. Oh, Mom, we've gone through this a hundred times. His name's Pete Major, and he's a grad student, and he studies very hard. Seems pretty strange to me that he never even calls you on the phone. Well, why should he call me on the phone? He sees me every day in the coffee shop. Mm-hmm. I hope going to that university hasn't made you a snob. I'm embarrassed to tell a man that your mother's a housekeeper. Mom, you're only saying that because you've had a hard day. All I'm trying to say, Jane, is that I don't know what this man is like until I meet him. You'll probably come into contact with all sorts of men in that coffee shop, and I don't want you to end up with more than you bargained for, if you get my meaning. I'll let you meet him soon, Mom. I promise. <laughs> Darlene, that she will not help her set the table for the dinner party. 
But now, Harry hesitates. She thinks to herself that perhaps she went too far. The very foundation of her life is threatened by Darlene. And if Harriet expects to keep her job, she has to swallow her pride, try to be pleasant, and do what Darlene asks her to do. What I mean is it's not my place to go fussing about with Mrs. Perry's china and silver without her instructions. Well, I'm not going to use the everyday place settings. They look like they were given away at a gas station opening. <laughs> Whatever you use, I don't want any part of it. I have chores to do. I've got to finish my work. Harriet? Yes? What's that I smell on your breath? Is that whiskey? You haven't been drinking, have you? Oh, uh, no. I can't fool me, Harriet. I know whiskey when I smell it. Your eyes are a little glazed, too. You have no right to go accusing me like this. My mother-in-law would not keep you on as a housekeeper if I told her you were hitting the bottle. Do as I say, Harriet, and I might be less inclined to tell her. Oh, yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. So we go upstairs. Mrs. Perry keeps her silverware in the middle drawer of the sideboard here. Well, pull out the drawer so we can take a look. The silverware is in that box there with the gold clasp. Oh, how beautiful. This is oak, isn't it? Look at how delicately it's carved. It's like holding a work of art. Now, let's see what the silverware inside looks like. Very nice. Very nice indeed. We might as well polish it. What do you think, Harriet? Mm, well, if you want them polished. Yes, why don't you do that? It won't be much trouble for you. Now, before you shut the drawer, why don't we find a nice tablecloth for this evening? Oh, look at this one. Now, Mrs. Perry bought that one in, in Europe somewhere, I think, and she hasn't even used it herself. Of course ago, wasn't it? Look at this beautiful lacework along the edge. How exciting. Did you want to use this tablecloth? Do I want to use it? Of course I do. I don't even have to look at the other tablecloth. It would be a sin not to use this one. It's so exquisite. That's the only way I can describe it. Oh. Now, let's see the Waterford crystal. Where is that hidden away? In this cupboard over here. Ah, yes. Well, why don't we open it up and take out what we need? I want... Four water glasses and four of those lovely wine glasses. It will really be a treat to use these. Why don't you hand them to me one at a time, Harriet, and I'll set them up on the sideboard. All right. Isn't this beautiful? Listen. Now that's the sound of good crystal. Here. All right. And another. Oh, it slipped. Well, aren't you lucky, Harriet? It fell on the rug. Is it chip? Oh, I would have died if that glass broke. Oh, my heart's beating a hundred miles an hour. I got to sit down. I think you better have a cup of coffee and get that booze out of your system, Harriet. If you hadn't been drinking, this wouldn't have happened. We shouldn't be messing around with Mrs. Perry's crystal in the first place. You let me decide that, Harriet. I have to leave now and work a couple of hours at the gallery. I want the table set for four when I get back. Mrs. Perry wouldn't be pleased at all if she found out about your drinking. Remember that. I have the house to myself for a few hours while little Miss Muffet is at the gallery. But I'm having a tough time of it today. Darlene thought she smelled liquor on my breath, and I got so nervous I almost broke one of Mrs. Perry's wine glasses. You weren't drinking on the job, were you, Mom? Oh, I barely wet my lips. I need something to get me through the day. And Darlene's a real stinker. She said if I didn't get out Mrs. Perry's nice china and crystal and set the table, she'd tell Mrs. Perry I was drinking and get me fired. Oh, you've got to calm down, Mom. In fact, I I'm calling because I want to take you out to dinner tonight. I think you need a little diversion. Maybe I can get Pete to come with us. Who? My boyfriend, Pete Majors. You do want to go out, don't you? Oh, sure. That sounds good, honey. All right. I'll pick you up at the Perry's house. <laughs> I think so. Uh, it's not too busy. Uh, why don't we sit in this booth over here? Want some coffee? No, thanks. Come on, sit down. 
I don't want you going away for a second. No. <laughs> it's a beautiful afternoon. And I insist we spend a couple of hours down at the summer cottage when you get off work. Mm. Pete, I want to talk seriously with you. Oh, what's the matter? Are they working you too hard here? <laughs> We can speak to the manager about it. No, no. It has nothing to do with my job. It's my mother. Huh? I just spoke with her on the phone. She's been drinking on the job because she gets so nervous with that Darlene who orders her around all the time. She was so upset this afternoon that she dropped one of Mrs. Perry's nice glasses. That's terrible. I mean, it's terrible that this Darlene should give your mother so much trouble. I wish there was something I could do. Um, maybe there is. I can't imagine why. Well, I was going to take my mother out to dinner tonight to cheer her up. And I wanted you to come along. She really wants to meet you, Pete. Oh, I'm sorry, Jane, but tonight's a bad night. Some of us from the department are taking one of the professors out to dinner. He's going on sabbatical. Honestly, I can't help but wonder what you see in me. You never introduce me to your friends. You never... Maybe I'm just another student working in the coffee shop to help pay her tuition. Fair game for grad students. Next year, when I'm gone, there'll be somebody else in my place, and we'll meet her and take her down to the cottage. Jane, look at me. I love you, Jane. I really do. I don't think of you as just another girl working in the coffee shop. You're very special to me. You're vibrant and intelligent and curious. And you're beautiful and affectionate and caring. And why all that? All that and more. If you didn't have such rare qualities, I wouldn't have fallen for you. <laughs> oh, you sure know how to win your way back into my good graces, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I'd fallen from grace. My mother would really like you. I know she would. My mother would be so happy to see that I was going out with someone like you. Oh, you're going to bring up this mother business again. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> At least I'll try not to. But I, I do want you to meet my mother. I told you, I'm looking forward to it. Now, why don't you hang up your apron and we'll drive down to the cottage? No, not today. I thought all our problems were solved. Ours, maybe, but not my mother's. I want to be with her today and, uh, Help her as much as I can. Now, there's no reason to let your mother's problems take over your whole life. Well, maybe you think that because she's a housekeeper, she doesn't really count. And you you can't waste your time meeting her. But right now, she needs me. All right. I understand. I feel for your mother's struggle. I'm not into sociology for nothing. Go to your mother. Help her. And, well, I'll meet her soon. I promise. <laughs> I thought it might be the furnace man coming to the basement door like this. Well, I didn't uh, think Darlene would like me coming to the front door upstairs. Probably not. Well, come on in. You're a few minutes early. That's all right. I'll keep you company. Fine. You don't mind watching me fold towels, do you? No, of course not. Where's your friend? I thought he was going out with us, too. No, I'm afraid not. He's having dinner with some people from the grad school. But I made reservations at Ricardo's. It will be pleasant, just the two of us. Always has something to do, doesn't he, your friend? Well, he's always wrapped up in his studies. I'm sure that when summer comes, he'll have more free time. If you ask me, he studies too much. Hmm. Not right for him to string you along if he can only see you a couple hours at a time. But, Mom, we have such a good time when we're together. I know he'll spend more time with me this summer. If he doesn't, then uh, I'll bump him. Yeah, <laughs> you do what you think best, Jane. By the way, I want to take you upstairs and show you how nicely I set the dining room table. <laughs> Mrs. Perry would have a fit if she saw her beautiful crystal and things being used. But I must say it looks grand. Someday, Jane, with your college education and all, you'll be able to have a nice table set like that, too. Listen, Mom. I hear voices from upstairs. That must be uh, Darlene and her husband. We can't go up there. Why not? Well, you haven't been getting along with Darlene. I, I don't want there to be any tension. I made that table look nice, and Darlene has nothing to squawk about. 
If I want to show my daughter what a good job I did, then I'm going to. And if any glasses get broken now, it's not my fault. Mom, you've uh, been drinking a little this afternoon, haven't you? Yeah, a tiny bit, but don't you worry about it. My spirits are up and I feel good. Mom, do you have to go up? I'm thinking of you. No nonsense. I'm thinking of you. I want to show you what a nice table setting looks like. It's something to shoot for in life. But darling, we'll find some excuse to give you trouble. Don't you worry. She won't give me any trouble. She's with her husband. He's a real nice young fella. You've never met him, have you? No, I haven't. Well, if you want my honest opinion, I wish you'd meet up with someone like him. But I have, Mom. Pete's a nice young fella, too. I know you'll agree with me once you meet him. <laughs> Concluding act of spring cleaning. Now, let's see. The roast is in the oven. I'll put the potatoes in another hour. The salad is made. The string beans will only take a few minutes to prepare. What else? Oh, the liquor and cocktail fixings are set up on the kitchen shelf. That'll be your domain. Everything's ready. Right. No problem. Oh, I also want you to slice the cheese and make up a nice cheese board. Fine. Fine. Harriet did a very good job with the table setting. She had nothing else to do except polish your mother's furniture for the 20th time this year. Now, there's no reason to be harsh on Harriet. She does what my mother wants her to do. Why are you so hot on Harriet all of a sudden? What do you mean by that? I was merely commenting on the nice job she did setting the table. Anybody with half a brain can set a table. Why don't you give me some credit for a change? I decided what crystal and silver we'd use. I made the floral arrangements. I prepared the meal. Darling, give me a chance. You're just like your mother, ignoring me and giving somebody else credit for everything. I give you credit? That's just what your mother says. All the while treating me like I was an appendage to her illustrious son. Oh, come on. You know, your mother is on more intimate terms with Harriet than she is with me. How do you think that makes me feel? Well, she's got a surprise coming to her when she gets home and finds out that her cherished housekeeper has been drinking on the job. Now, look, there's no reason to get mixed up in my mother's household problems, darling. Let it drop. I try to be good to your mother, and what do I get? Nothing. But Harriet takes advantage of your mother and becomes her closest friend. She's even down there now talking with someone. That's the kind of liberty she takes. Talking with someone? Sounds fair? Yes. Didn't you hear two voices? It sounds like her daughter, Jane. Jane? Yes. Mom, before we go up, I want you to chew the stick of gum. It'll cover up your breath. Look, Jane, if I know Darlene, she's going to tell Mrs. Perry that I've had a couple of drinks on the job even if I go up there smelling like a rose bush. Oh, there's no sense giving her any more evidence. Come on now. It won't do you any harm to chew a piece of gum. <laughs> All right. What a sweetheart you are looking after your old mother like this. I hope your boyfriend appreciates you. Now let's go upstairs and have a peek at that table set. Listen, they're even coming upstairs. Darling, we've been at each other's throats lately. Why don't we call it truth? You know I love you. You haven't told me that in weeks. What's come over you? I want us to change our lives, Darlene. We'll get away from our dull routine and go to Europe this summer. We'll enjoy ourselves, have different experiences, live life to the hilt. Like the summer we first met. <clears throat> Excuse me, Darlene and Herb, but we came up to look at the table setting. Pete! <laughs> what are you doing here? What are you talking about, Jane? This is Herb Perry, Darlene's husband. Darlene's husband? <laughs> but that's Pete Majors. The man I've been telling you about. Now, that's impossible. Pete? <laughs> I, I don't know what she's talking about, Darlene. She must be drinking right along with her mother. <laughs> Jane, we should go home now. Jane, what are you talking about? Pete? <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, I see him all the time in the university coffee shop. Oh, yes. Yes. I, I do seem to remember you. What? Jane, isn't it? You've waited on me a couple of times. 
Why do you keep calling him Pete? Darlene, don't forget, we have guests coming over in an hour. I want to get to the bottom of this. Jane, tell me, why do you call him Pete? Because, because that's what he told me his name was. Pete Majors. We, we spent so many wonderful afternoons together. That's a lie. You must be either drunk or crazy. <gasps> Darlene, why are we listening to this? We have to get ready for our guest. My daughter isn't lying. For two months, she's been telling me about this young man, Pete Majors, who never had time to meet her mother. Well, now I know why. I'm ashamed of you, Herb Perry. Well, let's face it, darling. We know Harriet's drunk. Uh, She's trying to blackmail us to her daughter so she won't get fired for hitting the bottle. I'm not out to blackmail anybody. And as far as I'm concerned, as of this minute, I'm no longer working in this house. Pete, uh, just, just this afternoon, you, you told me you loved me. Pete, uh, oh, Herb, whatever your name is. It's a fantasy. It's an out-and-out fantasy. She served me a few times at the coffee shop. Now that I think of it, we spoke once or twice, exchanged a few pleasant words, but she's implying a romance. It was a romance, Herb. I guess that's who you are, Herb Perry. I should have known you were a married man. Uh, I hardly know you. You don't know me. Why do you pretend you don't know me? It's no use hiding it from your wife any longer. Oh, this is ridiculous. Don't believe a word of it, Darlene. Aren't, aren't you even going to acknowledge me? Aren't you going to admit anything? I didn't think a few nice words to you in the coffee shop would trigger your fantasies like this. Is your cottage down at the lake a fantasy? Yes, that's what I'd like to know. Darlene, it's time for us to start thinking about our guests. Let's let these people get out of here. Come on, Jane. We'd better go now. No. Wait a minute. This isn't over yet, Harriet. Herb, you didn't answer our question. Is the cottage a fantasy? Well, I, I probably told her a little about myself, and I might have mentioned the cottage down at the lake, but she's twisted everything all around. Twisted? I've twisted everything around. Well, maybe the, the, the cottage sounded nice to her, so she imagined going down there with some guy named Pete Majors. <laughs> Darlene... We shouldn't have to listen to any more of this. She has delusions of grandeur. I see this all the time in my study. She can't prove one thing she said. I don't particularly care about proving anything. It doesn't make any difference to me anymore. Mom, I'm going home. I'll go with you. Harriet, please stay. I want to talk with you. All right. If, if you want... Uh, Jane, you wait for me at home. Goodbye, Mr. Pete Majors. Hey, listen, I hardly know you. And I hardly know you. <laughs> you hear what she said, Darlene? She hardly knows me. She admits she can't prove anything. So let's call an end to this discussion and get ready for our guests. I heard what she said. And I've lost interest in our dinner party tonight. I think we should go back to the apartment and have a long talk. We'll call Ron and Sue from there and tell them we're not feeling well. All right. That's what you want? Harriet. No. I have a deal to make with you. Oh, well, what kind of a, a deal? I don't want Mrs. Perry to know about our discussion just now. She'll only blame me for it and tell me I'm not a good enough wife or something like that. Now, wait just a minute. You act as though I were already tried and convicted. What did I do? Please, tell me that. There's not one scrap of proof in what that girl said. No matter what you did or didn't do, Herb, I don't want your mother knowing there was any question about it. The blame will inevitably fall on my shoulders, not yours. Oh, suit yourself. Harriet? Yeah? The deal I wanted to make was that you'd continue with your job and not breathe a word to Mrs. Perry of what happened just now. For my part, I'll give Mrs. Perry a good report about your work. I won't mention anything about your drinking. 
Does that sound fair to you? Yes. Yes, it does. Then it's a deal? Yes, it's a deal. Good. Well, we have that cleared up. We'd better start putting all this food away. We're giving the food to Harriet. I don't want to stay in this house another minute. Giving it away? Yes. It's not important to us. We have to start thinking about ourselves, our future, if we have one. We're going to Europe this summer, remember? Harriet, why don't you wrap up the food and take it home with you? Well, I won't refuse it. And I'll put everything back where we found it. The tablecloth, the silverware, everything. So my mother-in-law won't have the least suspicion that anything happened while she was away. Well, as far as I'm concerned, nothing did happen. Don't you worry. If Mrs. Perry asks me, I'll say, nothing happened, Mrs. Perry. Everything is the same now as it was when you left. And the spring cleaning is finished. And over. And done. <laughs> Theater has been brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. Spring Cleaning was written by Chris Fortunato, produced and directed by Fletcher Marco. Your hostess was Cicely Tyson. Our stars were Virginia Gregg and Joan McCall. Featured in the cast were Stephen Marco, Irene Tedrow, and Pamela Blake. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. This is Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI. CBS News. President Carter pulled another vanishing act tonight, but later turned up visiting some folks in a suburb of Pittsburgh. This is John Bohannon reporting on the CBS Radio Network. President Carter mysteriously left Camp David earlier tonight, and aides said only that he was meeting with private citizens, but they wouldn't say where. Late word comes from Chuck Meyer of station KQV in Pittsburgh. Billy and Betty Fisher are in their upper 20s. He's a machinist at a piping firm in Pittsburgh. She's a nurse currently staying at home with their 10-month-old child in a working-class suburb, Carnegie. The president and Mrs. Carter joined the Fishers and six other couples in the backyard for some lemonade tonight, and the group was asked about issues. Fisher said he told the president he didn't like the SALT Treaty. Some of the women talked about working and keeping kids at the same time. The Carters were pleasant and casual, said the Fishers, seemed very interested in what the gathering had to say. The presidential party stayed for about an hour and a half. The couple was invited to visit the White House at a later time. The president and his wife were sent off with applause from neighbors who gathered near the limousines in the meantime. Chuck Meyer for CBS News in Pittsburgh. There was an unscheduled event tonight between a doubleheader at Comiskey Park in Chicago. After the first game between the Chicago White Sox and the Detroit Tigers, thousands of people ran onto the field, started fires, and set off firecrackers. It was called an anti-disco demonstration, apparently because a local rock radio station wanted to destroy disco records. Police moved in, some fighting broke out, and Chicago officials say several people were arrested. No serious injuries are reported. The second game is expected to begin shortly. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee turned its hearings today over to witnesses who oppose the Strategic Arms Limitations Treaty with Russia. The chief military advisor at the SALT II sessions, retired Lieutenant General Edward Rowney, says the treaty establishes conditions which threaten U.S. security for years to come. Senator Jacob Javits of New York had this question. Well, how are you helping the situation? By advising us against the treaty. Senator, I, I don't think I'm advising against the treaty. There are many good aspects in the treaty. My advice to the chief... And my advice to you, sir, is that this treaty does lock into it certain inequalities. It's an unequal treaty and an unverified, but which need not be. It's my contention that this treaty can and should be negotiated on an even-handed basis. And in my view, it's not too late. Another former arms control negotiator, Paul Nitsi, testified that SALT II is riddled with ambiguities and will give Russia strategic nuclear superiority by 1985. President Somoza of Nicaragua says there's an international communist conspiracy underway to take over his country. 
and he's asking for the Organization of American States to convene an emergency session to deal with the issue. Prime Minister Begin is back home in Israel after another meeting with Egypt's President Sadat. Begin says he's optimistic about those meetings and says a series of agreements has been worked out between the two countries. A vanishing species may be on its way back when the U.S. mail lost its horses that relied mostly on foot some years ago. Today, about 85% of the Postal Service's 124,000 routes are covered by some form of motorized vehicles. But because of the shortage of gas, more letter carriers are being sent out to walk their appointed rounds. The Postal Service has about 9,000 walking routes now, and the goal apparently...